welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Indie Alaska is an innovative weekly web series capturing the diverse and colorful lifestyle of Alaskans. Real stories of everyday Alaskans at work and play. Supported in part by Alaska Pipeline Service Company. The National Weather Service. Good Thursday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 2nd of October, and as always, we encourage you to stay up to date on your changing weather situation around Alaska, no matter where you are. You can find us online at weather.gov slash Alaska or arh.noaa.gov. You can give us a call on the weather info line at 800-472-0391. Listen to your NOAA weather radio. You can dial that in and get your latest forecast information for marine and uh, what we call our public zones on land. During the day, you can find information about the rest of the weather picture on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube. In the afternoon, you get your daily afternoon map briefing. You can also link to that on Twitter. And on Facebook, you get kind of the behind-the-scenes story about what's been going on with the weather. It rounds out what we're talking about here on Alaska Weather. We saw a post earlier today on Facebook about your uh, changing weather in southeastern Alaska. So let's start with that. Strong winds and heavy rain are expected Thursday afternoon today through Saturday morning. This is what you saw on Facebook if you've been there today. Uh, offshore and outside waters are expecting gale and storm force winds, 15 to 25 foot waves. All of this coming in from the south and east. And uh, today and again tomorrow because of the cold weather up above the warmer ocean surface, there's a potential for some thunderstorms, especially late tonight and into Friday. Now for the inside marine waters, as you'll see in your marine weather forecast coming up in a bit, storm to gale force winds are expected. Some higher gusts in the narrow channels should also be anticipated, and this could last at least through Saturday morning. There's going to be some periods of heavy rain as well, as much as two to three inches of rain through Saturday morning. So your weather is changing as that weather front is working from west to east into the inner uh, waterways there. Wind gusts of 40 to 50 miles per hour are possible, happening from about now through late Friday night. And again, it looks like a pretty soggy period. So the weather about to change. If you have weather reports, the folks at the Juneau National Weather Service office would really like to hear from you. You can use Twitter and use pound sign AKWX or tag them with the at sign NWS Juno or just send some pictures or a comment on Facebook. That's a great way to do that. Of course, their contact information is at weather.gov slash Juno. So thanks to the folks in Juno for putting that together for us. As you saw, storm warnings along the Gulf Coast are expected as well as southeast. Gales are uh, up right now and will continue into tomorrow through Cape Sarachev all the way around the Horn to Dixon entrance. So the Gulf of Alaska is going to be a pretty choppy place to be over the next 24 to 36 hours at least. Meanwhile, up north, you wouldn't expect a vacuum in the Gulf of Alaska to do something on its own. In fact, it's pulling in colder air, and with that comes an opportunity for snow in the eastern interior. The folks from the Fairbanks National Weather Service office are expecting two to four inches of snow in the eastern areas there, and as much as eight inches of snow in the Alaska Range. Well, what about south central? Well, the mountains are expected to see some snow, and because of that, you might see some flakes a little bit further down below. Not expecting any major impacts on the roadways as we go from tomorrow night and into Saturday. But you're going to notice a little bit of wind probably. And you're going to notice a little bit of, uh, well, let's say a lot more snow across the mountains. And they're going to change their, their picture there as it uh, looks around from the low elevations around south central. So here we go. Here's the setup. Around the bearing, we have high pressure still in charge. You can see it carving out drier air across eastern Asia all the way into the Bering Sea, but it is shifting around a little bit and allowing that cold air to drop as the frontal boundary is working through the Seward uh, Peninsula through Norton Sound and slowly working its way southward. We have another boundary sitting here across the western Bering in the central Aleutians, and like we were talking about yesterday, the puff of clouds that looks pretty small on this satellite picture is actually a typhoon. Uh, this typhoon is expected to curve its way back around and eventually find its way back into a flow that could affect the weather here in Alaska. But again, that's many days away and we'll deal with that when that gets a little bit closer to time, but we are certainly keeping an eye on it. 
As far as the rest of Alaska goes, you can see the storm across the Gulf of Alaska right now. This is down to about 974 millibars, I believe, at the last reading I saw. A strong southerly flow becoming more of a south and easterly flow right up next to southeastern Alaska. Pretty strong winds there coming into the northern Gulf and again gales and even storm force winds out around the center of the storm in the offshore areas. Looking northward, it's not too hard to find the cold front in the satellite picture. Watch for it here as it starts moving southward. You can see that northwesterly push heading for the Yukon Valley, the dry air out ahead of it, and the colder air dropping down the yukon Kuskokwim Delta. So a lot of changes happening on a really big scale around Alaska. And, of course, where you are on that much smaller scale, you're going to notice some impacts from that over the next couple days. There's the front as we draw it on the weather map. High pressure up across the Arctic coast at 1,022 millibars. Some pockets of snow across the Beaufort and the Chukchi Sea coast late this afternoon. Our storm there at 974 millibars drawing in that triple point. The Probably the wet and windy part of the storm right here uh, just west and south of Sitka. As this moves northward here, the frontal characteristics will change, but what you'll notice in southeast is the winds picking up tonight and the rain starting to move in. As that happens, that could go on for several days and Friday and Saturday again. Uh, some of the strongest winds are expected tomorrow. Out across the west, the frontal boundary for the central and western part of the chain will gradually lose its steam. It probably just becomes more of what we call a trough of low pressure, which is a focused area of lower pressure, but not a whole lot of temperature changes on either side of it. A little bit of a wind shift and probably not much more. Out across the Gulf, our storm comes up to 975 millibars overnight. It's not necessarily stronger or weaker, not much of a change there, but it is moving northward. And in fact, it grabs a little bit of that drier and colder air and brings that through the central and western part of the Gulf. The warm front's reaching southeastern Alaska overnight, and with that, periods of moderate to heavy rain may develop there. And we're going to start to see an opportunity for some rain and snow to mix in places out across the Copper River Basin and also across the Alaska Range. Further north, that's expected to be all snow. If there's any showers to be had, it will be in the frozen variety. Heading into Friday, 981 millibar low across the northern Gulf. The front once again has kind of reclaimed itself as an, an occlusion. That means the warm air and the cold air are mixing up a little bit more, and that front is moving closer to the inner waterways there. We've got several bursts of cooler air wrapping in on the western side of this, and eventually this will mix up just as our storm in the west has. Uh, several waves of low pressure are rotating around from east to west on the north side of the storm, and that will help to keep the snow showers and periods of rain mixed with snow at lower elevations going, especially in the Copper River Basin, especially in the valleys around the Alaska Range at elevation. That will likely be snow. And across the north and eastern interior, it will also be snow. There may be some pockets around Fort Yukon and across some of the lower terrain that might hold on to just enough warm air that it may mix in a little bit with rain and or snow or go back and forth. And across the west, some pockets of low clouds, fog, and drizzle across the eastern bearing just outside of Bristol Bay. And the western tip of the Seward Peninsula may also uh, deal with some rain and snow from time to time, as well as pockets on the Chukchi Sea coast. That's Friday, and this is about as tight as a gradient gets as we get into Friday afternoon. But watch what happens on Saturday. The storm shifts even further back to the west. What that means is warmer air is actually going to move westward into parts of Prince William Sound as well. The higher terrain, uh, probably still looking at some snow. We're talking about the Chugach Mountains now. As we get lower, that will be back toward rain around south central areas like Valdez and Cordova, Seward and Whittier. But you're going to see some snow probably mixed in with that from time to time. The Copper River Basin will be a rain mixed with snow type setup. And there's going to be some snow on the south central hilltops around Anchorage and the Matanuskin Susitna Valleys. What we don't think about at this time is that there will be major impacts to the roadways. So travel's probably not going to be an issue. You might see some slush on the roadways, but at this point, it looks like the, the major focus for any uh, heavier snowfall will be up in the higher terrain in the mountainside. Southeast, you're still dealing with rain on Saturday. In fact, that south and southwesterly flow is working toward Yakutat, Juneau, Haines, but you'll notice that pressure gradient has relaxed, so that should improve your weather even if it hasn't stopped raining by Saturday. Out across the west, high pressures drop southward, and once again, we've set up a pattern where a frontal boundary is trying to work its way toward the western Aleutians, but it's going to have a tough time making a much further impact eastward thanks to that ridge or that blocking pattern at the surface. Underneath that, watch for some fog and areas of drizzle across the west coast. And across the north, periods of snow will continue. Again, we were talking about snowfall accumulations across the eastern interior of about 2 to 4 inches. And for the Alaska Range, by the end of this event, maybe upwards of 8. So that's what's going on there. Remember, you can always tune in on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube for more information during the Alaska weather shows and certainly afterwards.
Temperature wise, mid to upper 40s were seen across a large part of southeast today thanks to clouds moving in. And remember, we had a cold front swing through just the last two days. Uh, temps were in the lower 50s at around Petersburg and Wrangell. Hyder was down to 48 degrees. Ketchikan and Annette a little bit cooler today. Juneau was 43. Haynes and Skagway in the upper 40s this afternoon. 45 in Yakutat. Around Prince William Sound and the Anchorage Bowl, temperatures only made it into the mid to upper 40s. Cordova was 49. Homer and Seward were in the mid-50s this afternoon. Talkeetna was showing 51. Glen Allen was 34. Uh, Fairbanks had 42 degrees this afternoon. 45 in Eagle, a little more balmy that way. And 35 in Northway. Farther north still, the Arctic coast saw temperatures only at 30 degrees for Barrow and Atkasuk. Uh, Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse and Kaktovik were holding in the lower 30s as well. With Anaktuvik passed down to 25, Fort Yukon was 39. Ambler uh, not showing up, unfortunately, this hour at 37 in Bettles and Tananaw was looking at temperatures in the upper 30s. Around Kotzebue Sound, daytime temperatures were above freezing in the mid to upper 30s, in fact, for most places like Kotzebue and Kivalina and Shishmaref. 39 around Tin City and 45 for Nome today, a milder day there ahead of what's coming from the north. And mid 40s for Norton Sound. Unilocleet was 44. Galena and uh, Ruby both saw temperatures in the 40s today, 46 around McGrath. Grayling was in the mid 40s and Bethel also saw temperatures around 46 degrees. For the Bristol Bay communities, most areas saw temps in the lower to mid 50s this afternoon. The Alaska Peninsula was hovering in the lower to mid 50s. Kodiak Island, well, on the one end on the north around Kodiak, it was 52, a little bit further south around Fognak, 56, with uh, most of the Priblovs holding at 50 degrees or so. And Alaska Nutch Harbor also at 50, and upper 40s for Adak, Akka, and Shemya today, all at 48. Overnight low temperatures are expected to drop into the mid to upper 40s for southeast. In fact, some places probably are going to warm up a little bit more with that southeasterly flow. Prince William Sound in the upper 30s and lower 40s, 44 in Kodiak. It's south central temperatures into the valleys, looking at low to mid 30s there. 26 out around uh, the Matanuska Glacier, 30 around Fairbanks, 21 for Arctic Village, teens again for the Anaktuvik Pass region, mid to upper 20s for the Arctic Coast, the Seward Peninsula and around Kotzebue Sound. Upper 20s to lower 30s, Nome looking at 31, St. Lawrence 38, the West Coast and Southwest probably in the lower 30s for the uh, inland areas. But for coastal communities, you might stay around the low 40s tonight. So a big difference there as you still have some of that warmer air moving in. 45 around the Pribilovs, mid 40s for the Alaska Peninsula and closer to 50 the further west you go in the Aleutians. High temperatures tomorrow for many won't look a lot different after that cold front swings through tonight. Look for temperatures in the mid to upper 20s for the Arctic coast, below 30 degrees. The Seward Peninsula in the upper 30s, southwest lower to mid 40s, south central upper 40s to maybe 50 degrees around Homer. Seward, you're looking at 48 degrees. Prince William Sound also mid to upper 40s, southeast warming up over what you've seen today for sure. Lower to mid 50s in most areas. In fact, some folks down around Cloac and Craig could be talking about temps closer to 60, but it will be a warm and wet 60 degrees if you get there. Upper 40s around the Alaska Peninsula, St. Paul 48, Nunavak Island 45, Adak, Atka and Shemya warming up into the lower 50s. Flying weather now shows widespread IFR across the Arctic coast, at least, uh, well, let's say the, Ar the Brooks Range Mountains. Uh, the Arctic coast will be MVFR. Uh, south of Kaktovik, that looks to be a little bit more uh, poor visibility and uh, probably lowered ceilings as that northerly flow is sweeping that low deck of cold air across the, uh, the Brooks Range summits and then stopping. So weather should be improving on the south side of the Brooks Range, but on the north side, that is an upslope flow and that's going to reduce the visibility there for sure. Out across the western Bering and the Bering Strait all the way down toward Kiska, you can expect a wide area of MVFR. IFR conditions a little bit closer to Kiska itself. Uh, some areas on the northern side of the Bering Sea coast of the Aleutians and the Alaska Peninsula will be dealing with uh, very isolated pockets of uh, MVFR, maybe IFR in the morning there, but improvements should be seen during the day. Uh, IFR conditions expected around the hills near Fairbanks and certainly on the north side of the Alaska Range. And you'll notice this is dropping southward. Uh, during the day, probably by Saturday, more areas will be dealing with MVFR a little bit further south for both Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, but uh, that's going to uh, limit itself to more of the northern passes during the day. And IFR conditions are expected to develop across the higher terrain for southeast and around the Chugach, uh, generally east of uh, Anchorage and the Matanuska and Susitna Valleys. So here's your pass conditions. Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass are going to be IFR, especially on the northern entrances there. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, a little bit of a difference. Like I said, Merrill Pass will turn over to IFR first. 
Lake Clark may hold off a little bit, at least into the latter part of the afternoon. Rainy pass trending toward IFR conditions during the day. Windy pass also worsening throughout the day, starting out at MVFR, just like Isabel Pass heading for instrument flight rule. Mentasta Pass, we expect to see that as IFR. Tanita Pass heading for IFR during the day. So again, low decks and low ceilings coming your way. Portage Pass, VFR heading toward IFR during the day, especially on the Prince William Sound side. And Chilkoot and White Pass, we expect to be instrument flight rule. Obviously, cold air is trying to take the state over once again. The surface freezing lines all the way down toward Haines and Skagway and out across the west, uh, generally just northeast of Bethel and north of Lake Iliamna. Uh, the elevated freezing lines as low as 2,000 feet right over Prince William Sound, Bristol Bay, and then quickly rising to six, even 8,000 feet over southeastern Alaska. Icing potential, you should watch for this tomorrow, generally above 4,000 feet, but there's going to be some colder pockets as that front's working its way through. Above 2,000 feet, but below 8,000 feet is what we see across the Arctic coast and most of the Brooks Range, and across parts of southeast, generally above 10,000 feet. So the levels change very quickly from south central to southern parts of southeast tomorrow. The jet stream has a broad trough sweeping across the interior of Alaska, through southwest Alaska, and into the North Pacific. And the south side of this is where the, all the power is coming from. You've got a much faster moving jet stream right over the North Pacific, but the cold air is being funneled in from that northerly flow. And as you put it all together, this is the type of storm we're talking about when you get those ingredients in place. Low pressure across Prince William Sound tomorrow on the north side, 15 knots, but on the west side, 30 to 40 knots dropping in from the north and a south and westerly flow crossing the Gulf, reaching southeastern Alaska, especially over the Dixon entrance, around 40 to 50 knots. At 3,000 feet, our north and easterly winds coming into the central and eastern Aleutians are slowing to about 15 to 30 knots. Low pressure is pretty much in the same position across the northern Gulf, and we have that southwesterly flow still intact over southeastern Alaska. Light north and easterly winds coming across the central and eastern Brooks Range should keep the snow going there. And north and easterly winds crossing the Alaska Range may make for a little bit more turbulence if you're flying through some of the passes before visibility shuts you down. Turbulence then across the west should be expected. Light to isolated moderate there with patchy areas of occasional moderate, especially near the hillsides. As you look at the southern tip of the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern Aleutians, watch for low-level wind shear and uh, just general turbulence below 4,000 feet. And across southeastern Alaska, remember we were talking about some fast gusty winds there across the region, not to mention the gale and storm force winds there. So watch for low-level wind shear and general turbulence that could reach as high as isolated severe below 6,000 feet. It looks like a rough day to fly and move around in southeast for tomorrow. So batten down the hatches. We'll have your marine weather forecast and an update on the sea ice edge here in just a moment. Stay with us. I see a pattern here. Welcome to Stargazers. I'm Dean Regis, astronomer from the Cincinnati Observatory. And I'm James Alberry, director of the Kika Silva Pla Planetarium in Gainesville, Florida. Next week, we get to experience the second total lunar eclipse of the 2014-2015 Tetrad. You might be asking yourself, what's a Tetrad? Well, they're very rare, and in this week's episode, we'll tell you why. We'll also give you the lowdown on the October 8th lunar eclipse. Let's show you. Here's how eclipses work. Celestial bodies cast two shadows, a darker inner shadow called the umbra, and a lighter outer shadow called the penumbra. Your location with respect to these shadows will determine the kind of eclipse you can see. The geometry of the lunar eclipse is quite simple. First, the moon must be in the full phase, putting the Earth between the sun and moon. When the Earth, moon, and sun align perfectly, we get eclipses. Because the Moon's orbit is tilted by about 5 degrees with respect to the Earth's orbit around the Sun, the Earth, Moon, and Sun rarely align. However, when they do, the Moon passes through the Earth's shadow. Since Earth is so much larger than the Moon, our entire shadow can cover the Moon. How high above or below the Earth's shadow the Moon passes determines the type of lunar eclipse we can see. If the moon only passes through the Earth's penumbra, we have what's called a penumbral lunar eclipse. This causes only a slight dimming of the moon and is almost unnoticeable to the average moon watcher. If only part of the moon passes through the Earth's umbra, the darker inner shadow, we have what's called a partial lunar eclipse. This causes a noticeable darkening of a portion of the moon's surface. 
However, if the moon passes completely into the Earth's umbra, we have a total lunar eclipse. Now, if you remember, six months ago, we had a total lunar eclipse on income tax day, April 15th. Well, it may surprise you to know that there is an almost six month pattern for eclipses. We call these eclipse seasons. The moon's orbit around the Earth is tilted, appearing almost like a dinner plate that is tilted with respect to a dinner table. The points of intersection between the moon's orbit and the plane of the Earth's orbit are called nodes. If the new moon and full moon occur when the moon is at one of these nodes, we get an eclipse. As the Earth orbits the sun, it carries the moon with it. These points of intersection allow the sun, moon, and Earth to align at almost six month intervals. So for example, in April 2014, the new moon and full moon were aligned with the sun and Earth, and we experienced a total lunar eclipse, and two weeks later, there was a solar eclipse. If we advance time six months to October, the new moon and full moon again align with the sun and Earth, and on October 8th, we will see another total lunar eclipse. And two weeks after that, on October 23rd, there will be a partial solar eclipse. Although the six-month pattern of eclipses happens rather frequently, it's rare that you get four total lunar eclipses in a row. We call this a tetrad. A tetrad is an effect caused by the shape of the Earth's orbit around the Sun combined with the timing of eclipse seasons, and the sequence of tetrads varies over time. For example, between 1582 and 1908, there were no tetrads, but there are 17 tetrads between 1909 and 2156. The previous tetrad occurred in 2003 to 4, and the next tetrad won't occur until 2032. Okay, we've got our skies set up for Wednesday morning, October 8, 2014. The moon will enter the penumbra at 4.15 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. But you won't notice anything exciting happen until almost 5.15 a.m., when the moon begins to enter the umbra. Totality begins at 6.25 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So, if you happen to live on the east coast of the United States, the moon will be setting just as totality begins. So, you'll only get to see the beginning of this eclipse. However, if you live near the west coast, you'll get to see the whole thing. But don't worry, stargazers. Since this is a tetrad, you get two more opportunities to see a total lunar eclipse. We'll have another on April 4th, 2015, and the last one will happen on September 28th, 2015. All the lunar eclipses after that will be either partial or penumbral. You'll have to wait until 2018 for the next total lunar eclipse. So make sure you set your alarm clocks. And remember to keep, keep looking, looking up. up. All right, back to the sea ice edge. It really hasn't changed a whole lot, about 100 to 140 nautical miles northeast of Barrow to northeast of Kaktovik. We are seeing a little bit more slush ice forming along the coast between Prudhoe Bay, Dead Horse, and Kaktovik, but that, of course, is to be expected for this time of the year. For the latest Alaska Sea Ice Program updates, you can go to weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice.php. Across southeast now, as we were talking about, the winds are coming up for Friday. Look for winds up to 20 to 25 knots across the inner waterways. Stronger winds also through the Clarence Strait, five foot seas there. And you'll be dealing with higher gusts in all of these areas as the front is moving from west to east. So make sure you stay up on changing conditions if you're heading out. 17 to 20 foot seas coming up around Yakutat, 40 knots there from the south and east, and 30 to 40 knots. Uh, these are all sustained winds, of course. This is not factoring in the actual gusts that may be forming along with these steady winds during the day. For Saturday, the wind shift here brought to you in part by that weather front moving ashore. Uh, 25 to 20 knot flow there all the way from north to south. 35 knots up in the Lynn Canal, 20 knots from southeast across the Clarence Strait with a four-foot sea there. So some improvements noted on Saturday, but not a weather picture that's going to improve all the way for the beginning of the weekend. For south central, northerly through Prince William Sound, the sea's coming up three to four feet. Higher gusts coming in from the east. Look for 14-foot seas there outside of uh, the northern gulf outside of Prince William Sound. Northerly is coming out of Resurrection Bay at 30 knots, 16 foot seas there. And in the eastern side of the Barren Islands, 30 knots from the north and east with a 17 foot sea, while northwesterlies are crossing Kodiak Island, 25 to 30 knots there. Obviously a frontal boundary here and low pressure sitting out over the open waters where storm force winds are expected. 15 knots in the northern 
uh, Cook Inlet dropping to 10 knots with a two foot sea by Saturday. Some improvements noted inside of Prince William Sound with westerlies crossing the Gulf and becoming southwesterly. Remember that low pressure system is backing up to the west as we go from tomorrow into Saturday. Now across the Alaska Peninsula, northerlies for Bristol Bay with higher gusts expected. Some sustained winds up to 30 knots there north of Cold Bay with a 10 foot sea. North and northwesterlies in the North Pacific south of Castle Cape. All the way past Cape Sarachef, a 10 to 14 foot seas are expected on the Pacific side. Those diminish to 7 foot seas by Saturday, with winds also dropping to about 25 knots across the Bering Sea coast there, but still watching for some higher gusts and 5 foot seas inside of Bristol Bay. Across the Aleutians northeasterly, winds will rule the day on Friday with 20 to 25 knot winds for most areas. One exception would be Kiska at 15 knots. I'm sorry, Kiska to Attu at 15 knots with a 9 foot sea. Northeasterlies on the Pacific side, bringing you 11 to 12 foot seas on Friday. With more of a northerly push there through Unalaska and Nikolska, expect 20 knot winds there on Saturday. Easterlies north of Adak and Atka with a 7 foot sea at the beginning of the weekend. And across the west coast, northerlies pushing down from the Bering Strait, uh, 25 to 30 knots, 7 to 8 foot seas in the northern half. Around the Pribilovs and Kuskokwim Bay, 8 to 9 foot seas are expected there with 25 to 30 knot winds. By Saturday, a little bit of a change around the St. Matthew Island waters, but pretty much you're dealing with the same beast. 7 to 8 foot seas are expected on Saturday coming down the YK coastline. 30 knots around St. Lawrence Island, 20 knots around St. Matthew, and 20 knots coming in from the north for the Pribilovs with a 7-foot sea. Now across the Arctic coast, look for northerlies from Barrow all the way through Kotzebue Sound at 10 knots in the north to 25 knots around Kotzebue Sound with 7-foot seas there, 4-foot seas in the north. A westerly flow through Prudhoe Bay, easterlies north of Kaktovik with a 3-foot sea as that front is sweeping eastward. By Saturday, it's a little more uniform and northerlies are affecting everyone, but that also brings a threat of freezing spray across the Beaufort Sea Coast. So watch for those changes with stronger winds still continuing around Kotzebue Sound and a 5-foot sea there on Saturday. Recapping tonight's weather, a much stronger storm is working through the Gulf and this is going to bring some high winds and heavy rain to parts of southeast. Meanwhile, cold enough air working through the interior could drop a couple inches of snow across the eastern interior and up to 8 inches of snow by the end of the weekend around the Alaska Range. That's still headed south and as colder air moves into south central, we expect to see the mountaintops covered in white by the end of the weekend. We might see some rain and snow mixed together for some of the lower terrain around the valleys and the Anchorage Bowl without any major impacts expected. Stay tuned for more. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1 800 WX Brief for a formal pre flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. It's never too early to set expectations and goals for your child's education. The UA College Savings Plan provides opportunities that can help you reach your educational savings goals. Save in Alaska. Study anywhere. There is more information available by calling 1-888, the number 4, and then Alaska. This message sponsored by the UA College Savings Plan.